This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with Robert Harrison, Rosina Pirati Professor of Italian Literature at Stanford University, host of KZSU's radio program entitled Opinions About Life and Literature, and author, most recently, of Gardens, an essay on the human condition. Robert Harrison is not only the Rosina Piarati Professor of Italian Literature at Stanford University, but the host of the always engaging Entitled Opinions radio program on KZSU and the author, most recently, of Gardens, an essay on the human condition. Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Now, I want to start off with a little bit of context for the listener who might not have read your books yet. Where does Gardens fit in with the previous two books you've written, Forests and The Dominion of the Dead? What's the wider arc being drawn here, if any? I didn't set out to write a trilogy when I embarked on that first book, Forests, The Shadow of Civilization. It wasn't technically my first book, but um, it was a book that was published in 1992, and it was followed by Dominion of the Dead, as you mentioned, in 2003, and then I started writing Gardens, uh, thinking that it was an independent trajectory altogether. But then I realized somewhere in the middle of writing Gardens that it was indeed a kind of trilogy insofar as all three books seem to be concerned with uh, what I would call the humic foundations of uh, human culture, or let's say Western culture. The the humus being, you know, this layer of soil, of topsoil, which has organic uh, associations, but it also has deep cultural associations. And I think gardens is the third part of this uh, uh, larger thinking about the relationship between the, the human and the natural. And so how and when, I suppose, did it, did it occur to you to seek out this connection between the natural world and the human world in such a wide span of literature as these books cover? Is this something that occurred to you in your studies of these materials, or did you have to go and seek out these instances of, for example, gardens in literature? You know, my, I did a dissertation on Dante's Vita Nuova, and then it became, in a much elaborated form, it became my first published book, academic book, which was a highly intensive uh, analysis of one particular literary work. I was very excited to publish my first book and then quickly realized that it was a book that uh, very few of my loved ones could read, neither <laughs> my sister nor my mother nor friends, and everyone w was very curious to read me, and then it was very prohibitive because it was a specialized academic book. And I told myself, that I no longer, I never wanted to write another book that my fellow man or fellow woman, reasonably well educated, uh, could not read. And so first I decided to, to change, let's say, the register in which I wrote. And then it was uh, a time in the very early 90s when deforestation was a big issue, especially the Amazon issues. And then I started finding that all sorts of weird things were happening throughout the history of Western literature in, in forests, beginning with Dante, who was one of my principal authors, waking up in the dark wood, the very beginning of the Divine Comedy is in a dark forest. And as I researched the theme, I was astonished to see that there had been no treatment in any systematic way of the role of forests in Western civilization. And I found that it was not just a literary motif, but that in a very real way, uh, forest had always formed the fringes of the Western uh, cities and space of habitation, that it was a place of darkness into which the Western imagination had projected all of its suppressed fears and anxieties, as well as its fantasies. So there was a very rich story to tell, and I didn't, I can't say that I had any particular moment of revelation or realization that I needed to tell this story uh, from one day to the next, but it was a more gradual process uh, 
that was probably driven by my own personal love of nature, as well as concern for de- defining, in a, in a way more satisfactory to myself, what Western civilization's relation to the natural world has been. I want to come back to this point of writing for a non-academic audience when you've already gone through a, a serious amount of academic humanist training. Now, you said you had to alter the register, but how much of a, of a task is this really to, after so much academic work, to then return to writing for anybody? What I did is I tried to write, I tried to break out of these specific idiolects that you have in academia. My Books, I mean, Forest, Dominion of the Dead, and Gardens are not easy books to read by any means, but they don't exclude the reader who is willing to make a little bit of effort to um, find out what's going on. And the purpose was to retrieve this humanist tradition of which I am, a, a, I feel myself an heir, a rather professionalized heir. Uh, retrieve it, render it relevant, and to show how much it has to um, tell us about who we are and where we stand at this present moment in history. Therefore, looking at what happens in forests, in Greek and Roman mythology, for example, I found to be less of an academic exercise in antiquarian literary criticism and more an exercise in What do these myths really tell us about ourselves, even in our own day? Now, I find myself hung up on that word you used, retrieving this tradition. What tradition were you retrieving, and why why was it in need of being retrieved? How lost was this? Uh, Here I get into another element of my biography, which is intellectual biography, uh, and and it's the sort of Heideggerianism in which I was born. Uh, baptized, if I can use that metaphor, prior to going to graduate school and heavily in graduate school. And the reason I bring up Heidegger is because he is, uh, in being in time, he has um, this concept of retrieval, that one cannot authentically move into the future, either as an individual or as a community or a collective, without freely and creatively retrieving past legacies, and that it's through the retrieval of legacies that the way opens up to a future in the mode of resolve, and that's Heideggerian language. If you want a much more current example of that, I think that we have to look no further than Obama's inaugural address last week, for example. There was this constant invocation of the Founding Fathers, of our forebears, of our ancestors, and he says that it's quoting scripture is time to put aside childish things and that we what the old are the things that are are true and it is by returning to the old that we find our way to move forward very much the thesis of my book dominion of the dead by the way where i say that the dead have a natural alliance with the unborn and that the living are but a link within these generations and that in moments of extreme crisis it's the ancestors or the dead uh, who have traditionally been consulted on how to go how to move forward in a moment of crisis lincoln did the same thing in the gettysburg address for example and that was certainly a critical moment in this nation's history so yes retrieval is something I believe in um, almost as a, um, as a matter of faith, as a practice for myself as a humanist. And this retrieval, this, this consultation of the past, it's something that goes on, of course, in Dominions of the Dead as well as in Gardens. But what was the, the journey from that second book in this series to the third one? When you finished up Dominions of the Dead, was Gardens a, a natural next step for you? Actually not. Again, I I didn't have a larger master plan when I set out from one book to the other to the other. And there was a great deal of serendipity in the process. So I had been solicited to write an essay on 
the theme of gardens in the Western imagination by the American Federation of Arts that was putting together a catalog of uh, 20 major photographers to put their photographs together in, in the catalog. And having um, written a book on forests in the Western imagination, the editor of that volume thought to solicit me for an essay on gardens, which I gladly did and discovered that this was a topic in which I felt very uh, much at home and that there was, like in the case of Forrest, a whole story there that perhaps had not been told in full. And I, I tend to get rather frustrated when I merely scratch the surface of things and will look for every possible occasion to probe deeper and deeper into it. And so after having written an essay of 20 pages, I said, I think I'm going to write a little book on this, and it turned into Gardens, uh, an essay on the human condition, which naturally became like th the third part of, of this trilogy. When I think of gardens in literature, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, the, the ending of Voltaire's Candide. This is not something you neglect in gardens, of course, but how does, how does that sentiment that he expresses at the end of the book, how does that fit into your larger thesis about gardens? Well, the famous dictum that ends Candide is, uh, il faut cultiver notre jardin. We must cultivate our garden. That is spoken in the midst of a lot of nihilism in history and pestilence and wars and irrationality. And this idea that nevertheless, in the midst of all this uh, nihilism, one must still cultivate one's garden is an ethic that I take seriously because I think that one could make a case that we live in rather dark times or at least we live in times of carelessness and neglect. Our consumerist society seems to be the very antithesis of a cultivating society and despite the sort of reckless neglect or uh, of a consumerist society, it's nevertheless necessary to continue to cultivate our garden wherever and however possible. And that doesn't mean only literally. It means literally as well, but cultivation takes very many different forms. We cultivate um, ourselves through education. Friendship is a, something that needs cultivation. Conversation is cultivated. Marriage is cultivated. A, a whole host of things uh, fall under the uh, rubric of culture or cultivation. And for me, gardens are a figure for these practices of, of cultivation. And in a certain sense, it's uh, something that one does almost in a spirit of defiance these days. And this is a wider sort of thing, of course. It's, it's brought out in your book to a way to express why caring for something is important for humanity. This is something that I just have to get into because it's, it was a surprise to see his presence in the book, but a fellow that most people, most non-academics reading will only know as the man who, who coined the term robot. What did he have to say about this? Yeah, Karl Chapek, the Czech writer, early 20th century, whom I did not know except for, you know, that... Um, play of his for which he's, he's famous because of, of the, the word robot uh, appearing in the first time. But I read, while I was working on the gardens, uh, the, the initial stages, I read a review of a book that had just been uh, translated into English or in a new translation called The Gardener's Year, Karl Chapek. It sounded very interesting. I, I bought the book, and it turned out to be a fascinating story of this Czech writer who was an obsessive gardener and he speaks about the 12 months of the year from the gardener's perspective. And what one finds is, in his psychology of the gardener, the gardener is so devoted to what's taking place in his garden that he is completely handed over to the care, nourishing, solicitation, and cultivation of something which is not himself, but which is the flower bed here, the, the soil there and so forth. There's one line in that book 
which I, I would extract as the most succinct ethical uh, articulation of what a gardening ethic would amount to. And he says, speaking literally, one must always give the soil more than one takes away from it. I gave a lecture on gardens and a, uh, the owner of, of, uh, of uh, Ridge Vineyards came up to me afterwards and he said, this principle is exactly true of viticulture as well for wine. It's only if you give the soil, put more in the soil than you take away from it that your wine can be good. I think it's a principle of institutions as well. I know at a university institution, if there are not some people who give that institution more than they take away from it, these institutions would actually end up um, degenerating. It's probably true of communities, friendships, marriages, nations, and it certainly does not seem to be the principle on which modern technology is founded. Technology or the uses to which technologies are put is to extract as much from the soil or from the earth, from nature, to take away as much as one can uh, take away without giving anything back. It's the principle of consumerism as well, I believe, namely to enjoy, consume the fruits of the earth, you know, without giving back. And gardening as a form of ethical being in the world is, is um, committed to a wholly different principle. And do correct me if I've in any way misinterpreted your analysis, but what seems what you seem to have drawn from consulting with these human predecessors, one of the things that you've drawn in any case, is the fact that tending to a garden, whether literally or metaphorically, giving oneself over to some external, I don't know if work is the right work in the sense of a wrought object, perhaps, that's not that's not just a pleasant thing to have in one's life, but in fact a human necessity. Is that correct? I believe it's what human nature is all about. And there you, you, might, be, have, you might have in mind the opening chapters of my book, Gardens, where I revisit the Garden of Eden motif. And there's not only the Garden of Eden that comes to us from the Hebrew scriptures, this ideal environment where, which was given to Adam and Eve for their enjoyment, where the fruits of the earth were uh, provided spontaneously, a place that did not require labor, did not uh, include death, apparently, uh, where everything was um, handed over freely. And yet we know what happened. Eve ate of the apple, and um, humanity, ever since that moment, was set on the track of having to survive through labor, and mortality. But at the same time, in exchange for that, we were given natality. Eve became a mother for the first time outside of Eden. All of a sudden, things began to matter. Something was at stake. Care became the fundamental characteristic of being human. And one finds very many other um, such stories in ancient literature and mythology where care uh, is the essence of, uh, you know, of the human. And one finds that these ideal garden environments where it's impossible really to exercise any care or self-responsibility are places of utter sterility where human potential cannot be realized and where one exists in a kind of ghostly state of suspension, like Odysseus on the island of Calypso. That island of Calypso is a purely Edenic environment with flowers and violets. It's always springtime, no suffering. He's offered immortality into the bargain, and yet he is the quintessential human figure who spends all his days sulking at the seashore, yearning for his return home to a very different kind of island, the craggy, stony island of Ithaca, which is the land of his fathers, as he calls it, and where he will just take his place within the genealogical line and where he will reassume the burdens of being a husband, a father, and a son, and where he will eventually die. 
this affirmation of the human, of humanness in its mortality, refusing the offer of immortality in an Edenic-like garden environment, I think uh, says volumes about how human happiness must realize itself in conjunction with self-responsibility. And in the book you argue that, if I have this correct, we as humanity are drawing closer to claiming a, a, a bit of an Edenic paradise ourselves where we exist purely in a state of receptivity, or at least that seems to be the goal. And that is not a place that we would actually want to be, correct? Well, yes, you got it very perceptively that at least my argument is that whether we know it or not, our contemporary consumer society seems driven to recreate uh, the conditions of Eden on Earth, where uh, we would dispense with labor, where we would dispense with suffering and pain, and where we, we would have no other obligation as citizens than to consume the fruits of the Earth in a state of sheer passivity and uh, in an infantilized moral oblivion. That's why it's so important to revisit these stories of the earthly paradises. And if one properly understands what they're saying, perhaps we'll realize that humanity was never at home in those earthly paradises as such. And that if we were ever even to succeed in recreating one for ourselves, we would find we would be alienating the core of, of, the, of our humanity rather than providing it with its proper home. So, um, yes, it, it, you're indeed right about that. Is this an issue, this problem of returning to the unwanted Eden, is something that humanity can, you, to your mind, can address as a whole? Or is this just something, as, like as you mentioned, that each individual will have to find a way out of and into happiness on their own by consulting, for example, the ancients or their human predecessors, as I've said before? Yeah, that's where I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question you pose because I, 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 I'm ten, tempted to say it's the, each individual who must cultivate his or her garden. But we have to remember that Voltaire says we must cultivate our garden. And it implicitly invokes a community there in the plural. So something between the individual and the society as a whole would be local communities, uh, small uh, groups of fellowship, something that would not be strictly individual, but neither would it be social. It would be communitarian. It's, it's, it's the best word I could find for it at the moment, I would say. I'd like to get into some of the actual physical, real-world extant gardens that you explore in, in your book, Gardens. And one of the most fascinating examples that I saw in there was, of course, the homeless gardens. Now, what brought your attention to the contemporary homeless garden? Well, I have to, again, say that it's serendipitous. I was uh, having dinner here at Stanford with the poet W.S. Merwin and his wife Paula Merwin in the very early stages of, of uh, working on the topic of gardens, and Paula Merwin told me, do you know about these homeless gardens in New York? And she referred me to a book by um, Diane Balmori and another author, who, who, photographs of these extraordinary synthetic constructions in the midst of ghettos, kind of urban, inarticulate spaces, where these individuals had created for themselves compositions that one has no choice but to call gardens, even though they're not made necessarily of organic materials. They're made of lost, uh, you know, found objects, tires, teddy bears, uh, a few flowers here and there, milk cartons, and so forth. And when you look at the photographs of these gardens, they are extraordinary revelations of what kind of human needs uh, produce them. Because we're not talking about animal needs. These people, these homeless people, have had their biological needs, of, you know, their, their hunger, need for shelter, and so forth. Obviously, whatever 
drove them to create these gardens was something dis- different from that. And that's what I tried to uh, interrogate in, in my chapter on the homeless gardens. This brings up, I think, a wider definition of garden then. Could we call a garden, for the purposes of this discussion, uh, and I'm just improvising here, an external wrought object that is not vital to the um, the tender's biological needs? Yes, I think it would be one definition. I don't think it would be an exhaustive definition, uh, however. Because, of course, a garden, I mean, a, being, a, a real literal garden can provide for one biologically, so I'm not quite sure how to fix that definition I threw out there. Well, yeah, one can get into all the different kinds of gardens. There's kitchen gardens, you know, there's uh, uh, courtly gardens and other other kind of flower gardens, and then there are mineral gardens and Zen gardens and all that kind of... But th- I think that you're, you're asking a, a different sort of question, which is, uh, is there something about the urge that goes into creating gardens which is not sponsored by our the survival imperative, but is rather something profoundly linked to culture. I do believe that that is indeed the case, even though, for example, the Garden of Epicurus, where he founded his famous school of philosophy, it was a literal kitchen garden which in which the disciples cultivated the soil and they actually ate the fruits and vegetables that were growing in the garden. But really, it was the site for a whole different kind of cultivation of the mind and of uh, virtues of serenity and so forth. Uh, I think gardens respond to a set of yeah, non-animal needs, as we were saying before, the need for orientation, the need for repose. There are places of repose to a great extent. And when you start asking what is the um, what is human repose all about, you find that uh, we're starting to get into the realm of uh, something distinctly human that's irreducible to uh, biology. And I was glad to see the references to Epicurus made in your book, Gardens, because I'm not sure why this is, and it, it began to be addressed in your Entitled Opinions program on Epicurus, but why is he so much less well-known these days than many of his contemporaries, Epicurus? Well, Epicurus and Epicureanism was maligned from the very outset, even in Epicurus's own time, by the Platonists, by the Stoics, and by the Christians. And all of them for the same reason, namely... Epicurus denied, he did not deny the existence of the gods, he denied the immortality of the human soul, and he also denied that the gods had any interest whatsoever in human affairs. So the idea of Epicurus's materialism, namely that the soul is composed of atoms, and that at death it returns to a state of atoms, and that uh, there is no afterlife, it, it was this repudiation of of an afterlife which earned him so many enemies during his own time and subsequently. So most of what we know about Epicurus today, very few of his writings have actually survived, most of what we know come from his detractors. Therefore, I think that up until he still has not had his proper due in the history of philosophy. But we know enough about his, the, the philosophy and the, and the garden school to know that it had very little in common with what we call Epicurean hedonism. It was certainly not an eth- a principle of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That is not at all what Epicurus was uh, talking about. There was, he had a different agenda, which is to ask the question of what are the truest sources of human happiness? And where does a human being, how does a human being make himself or herself happy? And the great consensus, the huge dogma of the ancient world, was that it was only by being a citizen of a city, of the polis, that one could find one's happiness and realize one, you know, one's potential as a human being. Epicurus said that, no, citizenship was not the foundation for human happiness. 
that he withdrew into not something that we should mistake with the private sphere, but something that was away from the harsh light of the public sphere, where a number of social virtues could be cultivated in concert with fellow human beings in a kind of society of, of, of uh, friendship, fellowship. And, and unfortunately, this is the side of the story of Epicurus's philosophy, which doesn't get told very much. Now, I could get hung up on Epicurus. I, I do like his philosophy, and I could talk about it for the remainder of the hour, but I should move on to another uh, another real garden, another actual uh, plant garden that I assume gave you some large amount of inspiration for this book. It is, of course, the garden you were in, which graces the cover of the book at Stanford University itself. What did that garden give to your mindset writing this? Well, it's a small garden called Kingscoat Garden, and what did it give me? It... First, it gave me a garden that was maintained by an institution, an educational institution, Stanford University. It gave me something that was uh, I w- would walk by almost on a daily basis, something that is, was ex- is exquisitely as conceived, aesthetically speaking, by someone uh, almost 100 years ago. And it was a place that I could enter into in order to ask the question of what is the essence of a garden. And when I say enter into, that's a very important um, act because it enabled me first and foremost to realize that a garden is something that one is in, even if its boundaries are porous and permeable. One has a sense of inclusion. One is inside a space which is differentiated from what is outside the garden. The other thing that that garden enabled me to realize is that one is inside the garden, not alone, but with other living things, be they plants, you know, birds, or the fish in the pond. And therefore, life is what gardens conjugate with form. In fact, a garden is a conjugation of life and form. It gives form to life itself, even when it's using stone. And the reason I mention this is because many people think that gardens are a subset of, or that garden art is a subgenre of the larger category of art, whereas I maintain that gardens have a certain artfulness in their construction, but they are not artworks, because one is in gardens in a way that one is not in artworks when one is looking at them. You can't exist in a piece of visual art. You can exist, and very much so, in a garden, then. You can exist in a garden. You're part of the... You share the same sort of bio biomateriality as, as, as the other things that are in the garden. Now, you could say that a, a medieval church is a work of art, but the medieval church becomes a work of art only at a later age in which it is no longer experienced as a house of worship, where it, a place of communion with the saints and with God and so forth. One can be in a church, but uh, one is not in a church in the religious mode as one is it's not it's no longer an aesthetic object no longer an artwork when one is in it in that way likewise with gardens i think there's there's a sense of of being an inhabitant which is as you said if you're looking at a visual artwork in a museum uh you are not inhabiting it in in the same way If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio. On our website, colinmarshallradio.com, you'll find our complete interview archive, other podcasts, and more. My guest is Robert Harrison, Rosina Pirati Professor of Italian Literature at Stanford University. He's also the host of KZSU's Entitled Opinions about Life and Literature and the author of Gardens, an essay on the human condition. Now in the text, you mentioned that you do not tend to a literal garden of your own, although 
There is one metaphorical garden, an intellectual garden, that I do want to mention, one you have been tending to since 2005, the radio program entitled Opinions on KZSU, Stanford's radio station. Now, this program is also broadcast from a Californian university, specifically UC Santa Barbara, and it's there are some commonalities between between our programs, although yours, I'll get into the differences specifically in a moment, but and, uh, there aren't many professors who, I should add, have shows on this station, KCSB. How did you come into making this show at, on KZSU at your university, Stanford? Talking about tending my own garden, I feel that as an educator, I, I am involved in, in a certain kind of cultivation in, in, when I teach. Of course. Entitled Opinions was a different uh, sort of endeavor because I realized over the years that oftentimes having conversations with my colleagues at a university like Stanford, there were endlessly fascinating exchanges that would take place. And that oftentimes the uh, conversations were more, I could get a lot more out of them as a non-specialist of, of their specialties in a conversation than I could by reading their books or their articles, for example. And I said uh, to myself that it's a pity that these conversations take place in a little garden of our own that include only us. And with, you know, a, a, a radio medium, one could perhaps just try to go into a studio and have a conversation that is really opened up to um, a listenership that would be interested in listening from wherever in the world, you know, when we post on iTunes and we have a web page and so forth. And uh, you know as well as I do how much is available on the airwaves and radio shows and talk shows and so forth. And I told myself, I'm going to um, do what I do best, which is be an intellectual and a humanist and try to probe as deeply as I can is the issues, as I mentioned earlier in our program today, and bring on guests with whom I could engage in, you know, a sustained conversation for an hour without interruption on specific topics. And it began very much as, as, as an adventure some three to four years ago, and then slowly, slowly, you know, built up um, its core followers and listeners, and I believe enough in it that I continue to do it. I feel as if we do share a bit of a common goal our, in broadcasting our programs do in any case to, to a certain extent, be the change we wish to see in, in, for example, what's available on the radio. Now, I was looking at the comments on Entitled Opinions, and the comments come from, like you said, all over the world. There are people just with so much enthusiasm. I myself have a lot of enthusiasm for the show. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sit here and commit flattery, but I know that I'm not the only one who very much sees the show or hears the show as an avenue for something that they can't find not on the broadcast aisle, of course, but on even most of what's available, for example, on the rest of iTunes or in the rest of the podcasting world. What thirst do you think Entitled Opinion is, is quenching for these people who comment so enthusiastically and who email you and who tell all their friends about the show? Well, I think you, as you mentioned, it's the fact that there are so few shows uh, out there, as far as we know, as far as I know anyway, that uh, are of this, of this caliber of, of, let's say, an uncompromising intellectual, uh, an unabashed high-octane intellectual show. Uh, and that's largely due to the fact that, you know, KZSU, as you know, is a college station. We don't have to um, worry about audience share, and we don't have to dumb anything down I, uh, the same way you don't have to. And what's amazing is that so little of it is actually out there. I have a feeling that within the next few years, there's going to be a whole bunch of entitled opinion-like shows out there. I would certainly hope there's going to be some more clones because, you know, it's eventually you run through the entire archive and uh, you wonder where to go from there. In fact, you're on hiatus right now. You'll be back in the spring, correct? I'll be back in the spring. Got an email, I don't know if it's been posted yet, from um, someone just the other day who said, uh, enthusiastic about the show, and he said, 
I think it was a brilliant move on your part to posture as the most pretentious man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> really? Then, yes, and then uh, and and then uh, with a straight face, and then get into you know the then uh, the mocking, uh, the fun part of it later. And I think that he was referring to the fact that my shows typically begin with a uh, kind of monologue anywhere from five to ten minutes. But in, in a certain sense, uh, the reason I bring that up is that there's a kind of opening signal, which is, um, you know, if you want some unadulterated intellectual exchange, uh, you, you know, you're, you're going to get it, so... And I, did, I wanted to bring up the monologues, of course, because that's a very distinctive feature of Entitled Opinions. This show, my show, The Marketplace of Ideas, is a simple interview show. But you work in, of course, your own monologues to start at the beginning, introducing the topic in often a, a way that, that meanders around to where you're going in, in a way that I often find surprising. And some episodes have actually been entirely monologues. Now, was that... From the very beginning, a feature you wanted to include was monologues from you yourself, or did that just organically happen where you thought they would fit well with your content? No, I, it, I, it was never something that I intended to do. I think the first monologue I ever did was a monologue on birds at the end of the first full season, a whole year. That came from a suggestion. I That monologue on birds, the first 10 minutes, were taken from a monologue I did for the show where I interviewed Richard Rorty, uh, my colleague who uh, has since passed away two years ago, the f well-known philosopher Dick Rorty. It's one of my favorite episodes, certainly. Oh, is it? Okay, well, you remember that I, I did this thing on birds. Yes, and I, I wondered, where is he going with this? I, I know this is about Rorty, but there's birds, and then it, you just got there. <laughs> well, as you said, me meandering, you keep them guessing. I don't know, but... Uh, I know that he's a, he was a bird lover, and I said, instead of doing the boring sort of introduction of, you know, Dick Rorty and pragmatism and all this stuff, that I would try to put him, I would try to unsettle him in order to get him a little bit outside of his comfort zone so that he would maybe be a, a more energetic interlocutor. Someone told me that monologue was so moving, you really should do a whole show just on, on your own about birds. You know, I pondered it, and I said, well, maybe maybe I could do that. And then so I, I, uh, I ended up ending that season with that concluding monologue on birds. And I have to say that it was received with a great deal of enthusiasm from some of the hardcore fans. Of course, you only hear from those. So. <laughs> and, you have, and then you, you're tempted to extrapolate, well, everyone must have loved it, which is not at all the case, of course. And then I, I, it became a little bit of a tradition to end... A given season with a uh, with a monologue of my own. The good thing about it, Colin, is that you know you can take it or leave it. If you don't like the monologue, you don't have to listen to them. So that's true. Now I, I'm sorry to go back to this, but the fellow who said you were posing as the most pretentious man in the world is that is that a stripe of I don't know if that was necessarily criticism, but have have you heard feedback in that vein before? No, usually that would be. Those who hold that opinion, I'm sure there's many, many people w w would remain silent. You know, as Nietzsche said, silence is an objection. You know, thankfully, we often don't hear the silence, even though the theme song of my radio show, coming from the band Enigma, is silence must be heard. But that's a different issue. No, I have to say that um, when this writer was saying, that he posing as the most pretentious man in the world, he, he said that, that's the first impression, and then you realize that that's just a little, it's a mask, actually, or even like a barrier, uh, so that, w that once you're inside, it's a different story altogether. So it, I, thought it was a, I thought it was interesting or amusing that it was almost as if I've been trying to s send out a warning signal, do not <laughs> enter, those of you who do, are not ready for this kind of intellectual, high-energy stuff, yeah. But do you really believe that... The program is above the heads of of that many. It, it seems as if anybody with anybody with the will to follow the conversation could easily put everything together. I don't know. Was the issue really one where really one of someone having insufficient intellectual fortitude to enter doesn't go in, or is it? I don't know if this question is going to make sense, but is it more that they may a listener, a prospective listener may may perceive themselves? as not being able to follow it and give up. 
It's the same as when I uh, decided to change my style of writing. The, my radio show, I make a great deal of effort to make sure that it it does not exclude people. I, I want it to be clear and communicative. If we're going to talk about Freud for two hours, we're going to talk about Freud in a way that people can understand, or, or Hannah Arendt, or whatever the case may be. What I was trying to say is that, about the, the non-compromise, that... As you know, a lot of radio shows uh, that, you know, the NPR stuff, well, I'm not going to get into that, but however, there's a lot of time is spent, you know, setting the context, being very basic, and assuming that listeners are not as intelligent as they actually turn out to be. And I think the response to entitled opinions is confirmation of the fact that um, the listenership is you know far superior to what most programming tends to assume. I think that's something that we both do in a sense when we broadcast is a sort of an almost aggressive not talking down to the listener or a, a, a fervent assumption of uh, of high abilities on the part of anybody who would happen to tune in. But um, you can continue with what you were going to say. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Well, I was going to say something about the monologues, the strategy there, as, as you mentioned earlier, that there's something about uh, when it begins, you don't know, sometimes you don't know where it's going to end up, what's the point, how am we going to introduce, we're supposed to be talking about uh, intellectual history, and here I'm talking about something that seems to have nothing to do with it. But there is a, I do try to ad, uh, adopt more often than not, a, a strategy of, of deliberate di disorientation or uh, not defamiliarization, but something that will unsettle a little bit the mind so that it, almost as a strategy for opening it to possibilities of thinking. And that is something that, that I do in my own, with my own limited capacities. And sometimes they, it works. Some, and sometimes I'm sure it doesn't work, but... I can't help but think that the perceived necessity to shake someone up and get their mind open before you tell them things comes from your teaching. That's some, You had to have learned that in the field there. Yes, it comes from the teaching, yes. That's one of the strategies that, that is basic to, uh, to pedagogy and the humanities, for sure. First, you shake up. You try to completely trouble the operative assumptions and the state of mind, and this is Socratic. Socrates first, I mean, if you read Plato's dialogues, the first thing he does is try to get his interlocutor to realize that what he took for granted maybe not be, be so simple after all, and once his interlocutor is in a state of kind of creative, call it if not confusion, but let's say creative uncertainty, then the real work of philosophy can start taking place. Disorientation, or what Rimbaud called, you know, the systematic deregulation of all the senses. Of course, we're not talking about senses, but we're talking about, you know, thought. I like to try to unsettle, but, yeah. It, and it also depends on what the topic is and what mood I'm in. I mean, at a, at a certain point, as you know, doing this week in and week out, you, you oftentimes don't have the time to uh, completely plot everything out. Sometimes you just have to be intuitive. And sometimes it's better that way. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one other broadcaster-to-broadcaster broadcaster note I'd like to compare with you, and that's the fact that both of our shows do hour-long conversations, roughly, al allowing for broadcast IDs and PSAs and all that. And I've found that it's whenever I've tried to then reduce the time span to, you know, say, a half-hour conversation, it doesn't really work. I can't do anything of substance in, say, half an hour. Is that is that the same as you found? Could you could you wring the same intellectual substance out of a half an hour? Because I know it's beyond my powers to do so. I don't think I could. I've never even tried to do it in half an hour, to tell you the truth. I believe profoundly in when I write and when I do the radio show in slowing down the pace of thought. And this is also as an antidote to the kind of society we live in where everything is accelerated. And thinking, first and foremost, has to take place at a, a highly slowed-down pace of thinking. So 
I would feel very rushed in half an hour if I had to cover the same amount of material. And I'm sure that one could do it efficiently enough, but there's some some luxury about being able to have the full hour. And sometimes I feel that one hour is not enough and I do two-hour shows with the same guest, yeah. This experience of hearing your show and doing my own, it's it's made me cringe when I turn on another station. I'm not going to name any names, but when I hear, say, a five-minute interview or a ten-minute interview, I don't know if you had the same reaction, but I think, why did you even bother? Well, I, yeah, I've been on some of those shows myself. Do they cut you down to five minutes from an hour of recording, or do they, just, do they actually have you there for five minutes? It's never just been only five minutes, but oftentimes it's been with three or four other guests. Oh. So everyone gets their five minutes of statement and then you're supposed to dialogue or or interact the problem there is i think it ends up more often than not being diffuse i mean what do four people coming from completely different intellectual concerns how how much can they really dialogue about something that's why my shows with only one exception out of about 70 now so far have always been one-on-one conversations and i've often been encouraged why you should have more guests and have you know dialogue debates or you know, <laughs> and that's fine i mean it's a perfectly good medium but it's not entitled opinions entitled opinions is a one-on-one going as deeply into issues as possible it's the world does not particularly need another crossfire type show where you have one guest screaming at another and then the host trying to keep things you know a semblance of order exactly but some of my favorite uh, Entitled Opinions episodes have been, um, as we said, Epicureanism, the French Enlightenment, 20th century music, uh, the year 1910, Proust, the history of the book, uh, you know, as we said, Richard Rorty, Oren Pamuk, uh, the president of Stanford University. I was trying to, before this interview, to come up with some common thread here that I might label these all with. But other than that they're fascinating, I don't have anything. Is there a common thread to your mind with the subjects of the show? Of these ones that you mentioned? I picked a subset, but if... If there is a thread there or if there's a thread to the whole project, feel free to to enlighten me as far as what it might be. Well, I think that that there's not so much a thread thematic as a certain style of show that works well. And I think oftentimes it's 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 a guest who can speak about more than just one thing and make even a a specialized topic relevant to very many different uh, areas of concern and i think those shows that you mentioned are very good examples of that each in its own way whether it's a president of stanford who's talking about how you administer a university on the one hand but what the university's relation is to the society around it to the politics of uh, washington it's multi-dimensional and the same for a show like the year 1910 which we could say it's just an historical no there's a lot more in the very phenomena that took place in the arts and in philosophy and in music at, in that year and what does it have to do do with the year 2010 which is coming up uh well it turns out it has a lot to do with it because it raises the question what is an era uh, the history of the book we're in a moment where it's undergoing such a huge revolution in the material history that the more we know about the codex and papyrus scrolls and so forth, the more we appreciate the computer technology revolution that has that has maybe made the book um, something obsolete in our in our world. So, uh, if there's one thing that runs through these programs, that one hopefully uh, at the end of each one of them, we look at our own world uh, slightly differently as a result of it. There is one other light motif that I, I'll call it that I seem to have encountered in entitled opinions, which is the the recurring uh, question of the importance, or not so much the importance of, or the the place of the humanities in the everyday and also in the academy as well. On the one hand, that's no surprise because you are, of course, an academic humanist. But on the other, it does seem slightly unusual because. I think of the analogy with the bird who's very interested in ornithology, uh, the, the pr- humanist professor who's also very interested in categorizing where humanists might belong. Now, am I completely wrong to find that unusual? Is that more common in the departments you frequent than I think? Well, I have to make a confession here, which I probably shouldn't do, but I, I find that sometimes the, the worst enemies of the humanities are, are the so-called humanists. 
and I say so-called because it's, it seems that many of uh, my colleagues, not here at Stanford necessarily, but just generally, it's been a, quite a while now that, that we have gone through this period, long and prolonged period of disenchantment, historical, ideological, and for good reason. You know, we've, we've come out of a 20th century which was just uh, unspeakably horrible in many respects with all its victims and casualties, and uh, a Europe which was supposed to be the pinnacle of enlightenment, which descended into forms of barbarism unspeakable. This led to the questioning of what the humanist heritage was all about, and it led to, in the minds at least of many people, in, into a, the need or the imperative to deconstruct the very foundations of, of um of Western ideological construction and so forth, and therefore to bring to bear a hermeneutics of suspicion to the entire legacy. This is a subject I could probe for easily another hour, but we're running out the clock. I want to ask you one more thing, though, which is a little fact I latched onto while listening to Entitled Opinions. Is it true that you, your original path was that of a rock musician? Well, I, uh, I, I certainly was a rock musician in my uh, earlier days. And I, it, it was, came down to a decision when I was offered to be in a rather important uh, band, whether to go to college or go on being a, a guitarist, and I decided to go to college. That seems not to be a decision you look upon with regret. Uh, no, not at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> the current book, once again, is Gardens, an essay on the human condition. The radio program is entitled Opinions on KZSU and on the Internet as well. Robert Harrison, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the program. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it. Great, great show you have. If you'd like more information on Robert Harrison and Entitled Opinions, check out KZSU online first at kzsu.stanford.edu. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Check out more of his work at benalthaus.com. And don't forget colinmarshallradio.com, where you'll find our complete interview archive, other podcasts, and more. <laughs>